Welcome to another episode of Linebreak Rugby uh, with me, your host, Sav. Today I have with me Ed as a regular uh, contributor and talker on Linebreak Rugby. And we also have guest star uh, Crashball Rugby or Ali, as we will be referring to him in the rest. So if you wanted to go and look at his website and look through some of his articles, they're actually very relevant to the topic at hand that we're talking about today. Um, Ali, if you'd like to say hello first. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me on. It's, uh, it's our pleasure. And Ed, if you'd like to be annoying and chirps in. Hello. Feel free. <laughs> there you go. Um, so the topic I have today for us uh, is to talk about, obviously, uh, the devastating loss of England to Scotland at Murrayfield. That I happened to be sat in the stands um, getting grief and recording atmosphere that I thought, this will make great content as I sobbed to myself in the sands. Um <laughs> So hopefully the beginning of this podcast will have introed with them singing very loudly and proudly all around Murrayfield and uh, that will be a spine tingling moment. Um, but we want to talk about obviously a little bit of the breakdown and a little bit about how Scotland managed to dominate England in that game and how England can move forward and perhaps not panic as much as I've seen on social media because there is a hell of a lot of panic. Um, personally... I, my my first take on it is to say that England have been, was it two games we've lost? I'm not 100%. Two yeah, games two, in two years? Two games in, uh, certainly two games in the entire time Eddie's been about, which is about 25 or 26. Test yeah, it's uh, two losses from 26, yeah. But there was something interesting that uh, I'm going to quickly borrow from, uh, I think I heard it on the 10-14 rugby, is that mm-hmm. if you look at the broader picture, it's two from 26. Um, if you narrow it down, it is two of the last, I think, four or five away matches. Okay, so possibly an indication, if you wanted to force it a little bit, that there's an away problem for if, the English If, if you want to try and, you know, dig up some kind of narrative, I'm sure there's something there that can be uh, uh, overanalyzed. Yeah, okay. And I've, and I've seen a lot of, obviously, there's been a hell of a lot of an analysis on how Scotland managed to dominate um, England at the breakdown and how little moments of the ref either not giving small things that is pretty much innocuous. Um, such I, I can't remember if it was Ryan Wilson or someone just got an arm on Danny Kerr. Um, I saw the Dead Ball Arena posting a gif of that and hopefully I'll just edit that in because yeah. why not give myself more work to do? Um, just this small... Like knock of the arm on Danny Kerr, delayed him by a second, but as a result, the Scottish defensive line managed to get up in their faces, force an error, and that then was, Scotland are right back down the other that end. That moment was just before the uh, potentially deliberate knock-on um, that was just ruled a scrum, I think, from Finn Russell. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Which, I'm, I'm actually... I'm quite happy with potentially deliberate knock-ons in in that case being a scrum i don't know if everybody um perhaps agree with that all the time but people people actually making a genuine attempt at the ball like i do get annoyed when it is given a yellow obviously when it's an obvious slap down um it's it's going to be that way um <coughs> ali what are your thoughts on the response to the scotland game obviously from england i think sort of um as usual, across social media, you get the wide range of very humble, very accepting. And then you've got the other end of fans kicking off and basically saying that Nigel Owens is a cheat. So there's been, obviously there's been either end. I think for the most part, it's been quite reasonable. I've sort of, across various social media platforms, I've had a look and I think overall we've had a fairly reasonable 
taking to it. I think everyone kind of admits that, yes, maybe Nigel Owens was a little bit um, a little bit favourable towards Scottish. And interestingly, Brian O'Driscoll came out and said that as well this week. He was quite scathing. But um, yeah, I think for the most part, we, we know, everyone knows that England lost that game more than uh, Scotland were given it. Oh, oh yeah. I, I, I Scotland won it. They, 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 Scotland, they, they Scotland won it in convincing fashion. I think that's mm. my one. One of my big takeaways from the match was that I wasn't particularly happy with the standard of refing, um, and I don't. I, I'm not even going to begin to entertain the ideas that Nigel Owens is biased or corrupt or has been bought by someone. Um, I had in the match. I was. I'd already been fairly critical of. Uh, how he refed Ireland against France because I thought certainly for that game there were at least a couple of instances where um, he was more than warranted on handing out a card so it's while he's it certainly was the best ref in the world a while ago I don't think he's quite in the same space anymore but my issue with the match is whatever issues I have with his performance doesn't come close to the issues I have with the England's performance as a team and as individuals, especially compared to how successfully Scotland managed to uh, play just in all areas across the pitch. Um, so, especially yeah, yeah, more, more than anything, you've got to give credit to Scotland okay. for adapting to I, Nigel Owens, really. Um, I think John Barkley was quoted pretty shortly after the game saying that they saw how the breakdown was going and they, they weren't they weren't planning at all on going quite that hard, yeah. but they realised they could, so they went for it. And I think oh, in absolutely. contrast, so they, something England have had an issue with is it is adapting. For some yeah. reason, we just can't adapt to things, which is yeah. a bit And whether that's, whether that's down I, to on-field yeah. leadership or down to just tactics in general and how they're being coached I'm not sure but I think the breakdown was such a the disparity in how both teams attacked the breakdown was I think one of the starkest contrasts you you could see on a rugby pitch at that level because it was yeah. I don't, I don't want clinical. to be I don't want to be too negative of Eddie Jones who's obviously been very successful um, but the way England come out is a very I wouldn't say rigid because obviously they've got that that ten twelve axis where Ford's making a lot of decisions, but they they've got a play style and it's a very obvious play style. Now, if you look at other teams, uh, New Zealand, maybe not so much Ireland, but certainly Scotland, the way they play is much more adaptive. They're much more um, they'll make a change mid game and that will be what will happen. Whereas England, if the style, they'll just keep plugging away at the same style and it is a successful style. But it's not like like we've noticed in the game that they've lost. They didn't adapt to what the ref was doing and what was actually happening on the game. They kept trying the same thing, which led to the same mistake happening time after time. It led to the ball being passed into touch two or three times. It led to a breakdown of was it was it Mike Brown who ended up dropping the ball. I can't remember. It's like just just a couple of couple of silly mistakes. But it seemed like the same mistake would get made a couple of times. And it's because England were playing the same style every single time. Yeah, they they didn't quite change or adapt. I, I can agree. And with I think that. that is an Eddie. It is a an Eddie Jones mindset to have a style, go into the game, play that style, win the game. And when it works, it's brilliant. But when it doesn't work, it's obviously going to get a backlash that we need to be more adaptive. I, I think I think I mentioned that I mentioned that in a comment to someone the other day, but uh, in response to just because of the amount of. Uh, the number of articles that started coming out about Eddie Jones and that, you know, uh, he should be on his way out. And there is, you mentioned that there are the, the good side of the fans. There is also, the media tends to lean very heavily into the ugly side of it. Um, with well, that's where the, the, that's the, where the, the clicks are. Well, I know, but the derision they seem to have for just the first uh, sign of faltering. Um, if we If we put a headline here saying Eddie Jones must go... Yeah. You know, we're we're gonna get we're gonna get more people clicking on it to see what nonsense we're saying than if we had put just something, but it's, you know, England versus Scotland, the breakdown, you know, something like that. There is, but there are there are certain aspects of how we've been playing that because there are certain things that you can recognise, and there is the lack of adaptability on the field is is one thing that I I kind of picked up on because even though. It's the sign of a good team to be able to grind out a win no matter what. But there has been mm -hmm. a sense against certain teams where 
how we've been on the pitch has seemed for say 90% of the match second best yeah. and then it's the 10% that finally gets us across the line where if you think well, about that's what everyone was expecting in the Scotland game to but, be honest with you I, even in even in the stands yeah. everybody's expecting England to come back that last that last push but and even I in well especially I in the stands was thinking okay we've been rubbish yeah. we've not been good enough and then the Scottish fan behind me said, this game's not over. And I think, I don't remember what the passage of play was, but it, it we dropped it or the ball went into touch. And it was at that point, at the 74th minute or whatever it was, that I just went, the game has gone. Yeah. And it, it was, was a, mixture of, uh, a mixture of Mike Brown and Ben Teo, who, uh, mm. who put the ball out into touch a couple of times. Yeah. yeah. But the it, it's, the problem seems to be happening more often or it's being exacerbated by other teams seeing our knowing the pattern or knowing how we go about the game. I mean, if you think about the game against uh, Australia at Twickenham mm -hmm. uh, at the end of last year, I think we scored like 17 points in the last 10 minutes. And okay. so, you know, for the first, we were fairly close for the first 70. And it never really looked like it was a game we were definitely going to win. And then in the last 10 minutes, there was, you know, they fell apart right. and we switched on and I feel like it's either happening less and less often or it's happening later and later um, but I think there it is it's noticeable so we needed we needed another 10 minutes against Scotland is that what you're saying could I, uh, well, maybe not in that case but should have played on I think that's partly because the uh, the disruption that's actually happened to Eddie Jones finishes I think before you had uh, so you had Jamie George Carl Sinclair um, Courtney Laws, Sam, or not Sam Simmons, but a a back rower, Danny Kerr, and Ben oh. Tio and Jack Noel coming off the bench. Those are all impact strong players. Courtney right? Laws started, I think, but I well, think the I biggest thing did. was uh, did, Underhill I mean, in, getting in the his past, yellow card. You've had Courtney Laws or Launchbury sure, coming yeah. from the bench, and that's been that's been an impact. There's not been anywhere near as as much. If you look at some of the bench players I've had recently, it's not mm. they've not had the same. They don't have the same impact, so I think that's also yeah. it been a big difference to why they're not putting on the same points in the the end stages. I, t I certainly well, if we if we look at that again, I haven't got the team in front of me, but obviously the selection for this week versus France is not left field, but you know it, th there have been drastic changes. He's he's put some changes that I think the fans have been asking for. That the Watson at fifteen was a big call. Uh, that people have been asking for. Uh, Jamie George obviously starting at hooker um, is something that people have been asking for and Daly being brought back in. These things that obviously England fans have been chomping at the bit wanting to do frees up that whoever was starting now sits on the bench. So yeah, that'll impact the finishes I think eventually. It is, I do think looking at the, looking at the squad, I don't think, I mean... I'm not entirely sure how much impact you can expect from the replacement backs we have compared to the replacement forwards. Because I think having having Haskell, Simmons, having Sinclair come off the bench, I think will be a massive, massive boost. But, Ed, we'll just we'll just put Simmons on the wing. I don't I don't <laughs> see the issue really. But no, but I think just the backs stick. just strike me as being uninspired. Perhaps isn't the right word, but it comes close. We've got Wigglesworth, Joseph, and Brown. And I think Joseph should probably be starting, but he's been very average. I mean, he's not obviously he's not bad defensively. He's very astute at drift defence and making sure that there's no space for the wingers, stuff like that. Yeah. But if we look at the way that Finn Russell floated the ball out to Hugh Jones and how the Scots did run riot down that channel, there's no getting around it yeah. that Joseph did have huge problems against Scotland, yeah. um, and. That that's a that's an issue, and that's something that he's been so reliable at for such a long time. And if if his attacking game is being a bit neutered, and then he's having trouble in that area as well, then I think Eddie Jones is making a, a good call in saying, "Look, come back stronger." And Joseph can come back stronger, mm. but let's see what someone else can do in that position. It's also because Bastero is huge, and I think Tio and Bastero yeah. colliding is just going to be great TV. So true. That that'll be quite helpful. Um, I think the big thing for me though is I do genuinely. Th it's I know he's only just back from injury, 
But I think at this mm-hmm. stage it might have been more sensible to have Itoji on the bench, move Laws to five, Rob Shaw to six, and have one of Haskell or Simmons in at seven. Just to have I a slightly more well rounded back row. Um, how, Ali, how do you feel about Laws at six? Because it's happened, obviously, obviously, it's happening very consistently now. Um, he's, he's, his ball carrying game has increased. He's always been a great tackler decent at the ruck and he's very good at looking after Johnny May when Johnny May's having issues on his wing but what, what are your thoughts on him at six so I'm, I've never been a fan of second rows playing on the blind side even when Itoji was in form in his second year um, first or second year with, with England I really mm-hmm. didn't like it I and mean, I understood it because of the options at the time Jones didn't have um, test proven options there and I kind of understood it but Recently, he's had options and he's been persisting with with laws at six, and I, just, I don't I don't like it. I think you lose a mobility around the park um, if you don't play, you know, a Haskell Simmons Underhill on on the open side and put Rob, put Rob Shaw back to six. And it, it's not necessarily even about the breakdown. I'm talking um, is is in Jackling, but it's it's getting to the breakdown, getting little nuances, getting to somewhere quick enough. At times, laws can be a little bit lumbering. Um, and he just, it's, just, just straight it's up. Big levers. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, if you put Rob Shaw or Laws to an obstacle course, who's going to get through that faster? I mean, probably Rob Shaw, and he's not even the most mobile of flankers. Um, okay. You put an underhill or a Simmons to an obstacle course ahead of Laws, who, you know, hands down, who's going to win? And it's just yeah. things like that. It's getting, it's getting to support places a bit quicker, and I think having three second rows just limits it. Mm-hmm. I think the way. And I 100% agree with you that our mobile, um, it's not that he's not mobile around the park or his engine isn't very good, but yeah, it's those. It's that one second slower over 100 metres or, or a tenth of a second over 10 metres. These sorts of things add up over a game and you've got an issue. Um, it's what he does provide, obviously, is we have a better line out coordination we have set line outs and if the way we're winning a game which i think england have done reasonably well is to win a penalty kick close to the corner or as close as we can win the line out either maul over we can't maul over that's fine then we hit the 10 12 axis and then a winger or johnny or um joseph goes over and that's kind of been the way or we get it wide to watson or daily that's kind of been the way that we win games we just get the penalty and then rely on our set piece which is why having the second row has worked. But in games like against Scotland, like I think if we played against New Zealand, where both teams try to not have set piece, like they don't want to, they don't want to necessarily have a punch up up front. They don't want a forwards game. They want a free flowing uh, offloading. Although Scotland apparently offloading is not what they've been doing, but they want a more open game. I, I think that, yeah, we're limited. We're limited with Laws at six, and we would be better off with an Underhill or someone else. Not And it's not because Laws isn't good, because he's a good player, but maybe someone else should uh, should be there. I, I can imagine Ed doesn't agree, because Ed likes Laws. I, it's, I think certainly... I mean, it's, it's cropping up a fair bit every now and again at the moment, but I think the big thing for me at the mm. moment is that the lock situation has been something interesting for the last few years. Um, constantly changing who's on top. Um, I think for me at the moment, though, one of the biggest failings is just the amount of rugby that Itoje has been playing over the last two years. He has, There has been, in similar fashion to Cruz, if not quite so, uh, quite so stuck, I think Itoje has had a fairly large drop-off in quality and intensity, and I think it would probably suit him best either to just have a few weeks out of the squad or be coming off the bench. Um, because yeah, again, him, it's, him and North need to go and have a holiday, do they? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's. I mean, there's there's some, there's absolutely something to be said for a back row that can play like a lock or a lock that can play like a flanker. But I think it's mm-hmm. it's play. It's while I recognise that it has worked over the last two years while Jones has been doing it, I think there's more to the team dynamic than just the locks, and it has something to do with you know having Billy about, having Haskell about, but I think at the moment it would make more sense for Itoje to be coming off as an impact player, as, as a finisher, and Laws and Launchbury linking back up um, in the second row. 
um, because Laws Laws' play style has just come on an absurd amount in the last couple of seasons, and I think he's one of the few players that has been absolutely outstanding for us uh, in the championship so far. Um, I'm constantly reading from Northampton fans that um, while Saints basically just give up, he's one of the few players that sticks with them and uh, sees out the games best he can while everyone just drops off. Um, See, I, I knew I knew you'd be a big Laws fan. I knew this was coming. I wasn't. I mean, actually, I might always have been because I think even we, if, if we go back far enough, I was always champion, championing uh, him and Launchbury for greatness. And then, it, but then Itoji and Cruz came and usurped them. But I think particularly now that we have, particularly I think in this case because Haskell and Simmons are both. Well, it might be interesting because we played Simmons at eight last time, but I think he could. Mm-hmm. I think he is a better long-term option at seven than Underhill. I think Underhill makes more sense at six. Um, and so, considering I mean, if if Fred if Fred was here, he would he would just be telling you that back row six or seven makes no difference. But well, he's French; he's yeah, got no I idea what, what he's mean. saying. Um, but I think in this case, with both Hath- both Haskell and Simmons on the bench, I think it would make much more sense because I, mm-hmm. I mean Eddie Jones played. Haskell at seven for a year and a half, so he's already got the pedigree there. Simmons played so well against Italy. Um, I think it would make more sense, as I say, if if Itoji dropped to the bench, shift Laws and Robshaw down again because Robshaw, Robshaw shouldn't be in seven. I think Robshaw as a six is our strongest workhorse. The amount of work he gets through is unparalleled. And then if you put mm-hmm. someone like Haskell or Simmons in at seven. It, it gives the back row a bit more balance. It gives the second row a bit more stability. Um, yeah. And I think there's a the but then, dynamic But then there obviously, I think you're, you're alluding to that, the fact that we are wholly reliant on a Billy V type character to, to, to make up all of that hard yard. There is something of, to be said game for that as well. Stuff, but again, it's... I think the other side... I mean, if we bring it back to the Scotland game, we were exposed is perhaps an understatement with regards to the breakdown work in the I mean however it was happening Itoje clearing mm-hmm. a player too far out us just not committing enough players to the ruck whatever I mean mm-hmm. I think against Wales even Farrell was getting turnovers and then against Scotland the ruck was just a free for all for anyone to get in on and so for, for Barkley or Watson or Wilson to just get on on the ball and then we'd be penalised because we'd have absolutely nothing to counter it. Um, I feel well, like... I think this... I don't, know, I don't know if this was Ali who brought this up or someone else may have brought it up, but having, having Haskell on the pitch yeah. to control the breakdown, to win the ball, to recycle possession, to do these just basic things that perhaps laws that's a couple of seconds slower or a second slower or something isn't quite doing mm. and maybe we're for maybe we're forcing a narrative because it's one loss and it's no big deal and we shouldn't really you know rome isn't burning or whatever yeah not yet but it, it, it's just it's it's just it, it's interesting to me i think obviously there's a lot of talk about whether haskell's even going to get a new contract at wasps and i don't think he is but i don't know that um no, he's, he is definitely leaving Wasps. Okay, it's just whether go. it's just where he's going to That's going question, to go. I know Bordeaux, Bordeaux Begler have offered him a pretty significant contract, but obviously he okay. needs to stay in England if he wants to play for England. So he was uh, talking to Worcester, wasn't he, or someone? Yeah, Worcester, Northampton, and Bristol were rumoured all to be interested. I think one of the okay. Scottish the, teams is also on the cards. Oh yeah. Um, I can't remember what it, oh yeah, it was Glasgow. Glasgow were rumoured okay. to be interested, but obviously again that's that's again, that's probably a no go over Haskell if he wants to play in England. Unless Eddie Jones says it's a special scenario, but it's I don't think UK he will. Thing. Yeah, but I don't think he will just because when fit, you've also got who I think is actually the best open side flanker in the country is Tom Curry and Sam mm-hmm. Underhill. So you've got those two ahead of Haskell, perhaps. So they were at one point anyway. Um so yeah, yeah. I think I don't. Th- I think Haskell has to stay in England, basically. I think we're all, and this is not really our fault, but we've all like stopped talking about Zach Mercer as well. Yeah, you know that's someone. Um, I've actually been talking a little bit about um about why he should be in for the lineout issues. I think I know you mm-hmm. spoke about 
if you take you know the benefit of having three uh three mm-hmm. locks is that extra line out but then it's annoying because eddie jones is kind of ignoring the other options he's got that are actually back rowers and can play uh in yeah. the line out like again the fan favorite don armand um but then there's Zach yeah. mercer and also gary graham and maybe mike wilson from newcastle um yeah. I'm not sure as much about Mark Wilson, but I know Gary Graham is a bit more mobile and he's he's more of an option in the lineup. But it just, it just frustrates me because uh, that's a reason everyone says. But it's like, well, if he actually was concerned about that and was still wanted to flank, he could have picked all these players. I mean, yeah. it's, I don't understand it. It's it's a, for the most part, I tend to give Eddie Jones the the benefit of the doubt because when he first came in in that first year, it seemed like to me he did everything down, everything was down to a T, down to the man management, to the yeah. selection of how he led up the cones. Like I thought he got everything right, but things are starting to starting to crack. Uh, I wrote an article about it actually, about um, England's 2017, and I talked yeah. about how the cracks were beginning to show, and in 2018, it, it's continued, and it, it's odd. He's almost gone a little bit Warren Gatland in the way that he's got a little bit stubborn in some of his... About his decision-making. Yeah, and it kind of annoys me. It's, it, it seems like a lot of it is driven by the media as well, by his, sorry, by his reaction to the media. Yeah, he, he, well, he likes playing them. He does, but at the same time, he's very stubborn. And it was it was part of the reason that saw him fall out with Australia in 2005. It was an ugly mm. fallout because he is stubborn. And that's been <clears> the problem. While, while everyone was... While the media were getting enough clicks seeing his praises in the first year, it was fine. They yeah. have to worry about it. But obviously, media, they can't keep doing the same thing if they want to keep people mm-hmm. coming to them so they had to change it up a little bit and when they started hinting towards it jones got more abrasive so they wrote about that and it just kind of went a bit downhill it. yeah and i think but a lot it's of the it whole is... it's the whole stare into the abyss and the abyss stares back yeah he, he he was playing it he was doing that thing he was doing the whole media hype and then all of a sudden you know it's infected his mindset as much as he was trying to get into their heads because he's thinking about the next thing that he's going to do in reaction to them, I think. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I mean, and a, health, a healthy, a good healthy coach admits when he's wrong straight away. You look at how we took off Tamina Harrison um, and uh, Luther Burrell in Australia in his first year. Yeah. He clearly, really, yeah, well, yeah, and even before half time for, yeah. for Harrison, and he, yeah, yeah. he clearly stated he said I got I got it wrong, so I changed it. And it seems now like you need to be able to a coach needs to be able to have the ability to go I got that wrong, but I think. Because because Eddie Jones kind of hardened himself towards other people's comments, he he clearly to me he clearly wasn't as comfortable admitting that he was wrong, which is mm-hmm. it's one of those tiny things. It's not a conscious thing. He's not consciously doing it. It's obviously it, it's a thing that builds up over time, and it, you know it's human error. He's not yeah. he's not some robot that he probably was acting like in the first year. We got everything right. Um, as time went on, we you know he's human. It happens, but but he he's meant to be like now is meant to be peak England. He's, he is basically, I mean, originally I think it was, he said seven of these players will be in the 2019 World Cup or something. So there was something like that. And then he made all of these tests with Harrison and some of the other players and even Tom Wood early on still playing all of these things. And then he made changes at half time. But now the team is meant to be wholly, if not even, you know, three quarters is meant to be the team that will turn up in 2019 and win the world cup. So if he makes these dramatic halftime changes, he might feel to himself that he hasn't set the team up right. Even if it works and makes that dramatic changes, he might be in his head just going, well, maybe that's what have I done for two years? I need to trust what I've done in the past two years. And he's believed his own hype a bit and just gone, maybe I shouldn't make a change. I suppose. Yes. But then with the back row issue, I think you could almost say, well, he knows he got it right when he had mm-hmm. when he had Robshaw and Haskell. So now he's he's almost he was originally forced into playing locks at blindside because of injuries. So it's kind of mm-hmm. like, well, surely he knows that that's not his first choice and that he needs to change it because it's not what he it's not what he wanted originally. True. So he's, he shouldn't have an issue in changing up what he didn't want. Now he should he should have learned that lesson. Yeah, go on. Yeah, well, I mean, and also it's what I find interesting is I don't think he would have. I don't think he went into this Six Nations, or sorry, this season, thinking he'd have to play a lock at six because it looked to me like he very much saw Sam Underhill as the prodigal son. It seemed like he was like he was going to get him straight in there at, yeah. blind, at open side, and I think, I think the most the most the most damning thing for Underhill was his performance against, I think it was Samoa or Australia where he got <sighs> penalised a few times at the breakdown, and I think what mm, happened Matt was. Kovacic style. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was just it was just kind of brainless things, and I think Jones basically saw these 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 issues in his play that, that weren't there before, and suddenly realised, oh, 
th- th- that's not okay. That's not good. He's not what I thought he was. I can't mm. just I can't get him in and start him and have him going. And then he, you know, the, the next man he would have looked at would have been Tom Curry, who started yeah. in uh, against Argentina and got man of the match in his first full cap. Um, it, I think he 100%. obviously, and, it's just, and his other option would have been Haskell, who was injured and now hasn't been able to find form. So he's kind of yeah. had to go to. Yeah, had to go to the other options. Go down to go down to laws at six and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, I I mean I I really interested in in Mercer personally. I mean watching him hunt down Smith at the weekend, uh, putting me into touch. I mean that that clip on its own just speaks volumes. Not not only to how quick he is, but to how determined he is as a player to win every single game and to not let other people beat him. Mm. And at seven for that game as well, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and and that again. I mean, does that mean that he's fighting Simmons? As an extra fan, I'd rather he wasn't. I, I just, you know, I want Simmons to be on the pitch. And the fact that he's sitting on the bench obviously would be great, but um, I want Simmons on the pitch. And, and his brother, obviously, the article you've written, uh, and his brother's doing really well as well, taking over a little bit from Steenson and uh, leading the charge for um, for rugby in the Southwest. Mm. So his brother plays um, at 10, is that right? His yep. brother does play at ten. He hasn't. Re- he's had a couple of starts in Anglo Welsh and kind of the the European kind of stuff. But he's not. I don't know if that was his first start. It might have been his in first the start at ten in the Premiership. Yeah, does, uh, I think. Um, I think it was. How does he compare yeah. to the the true heir apparent in the uh, the new Messiah that is Marcus Smith? He's kind of oh. similar, I find. Uh, in a way, I really like Marcus Smith as well. Who doesn't? Um, he's fantastic. I think I think they've both got balls. I think Marcus Smith might have bigger balls. <laughs> I don't know. I think Simmons is I think Simmons is quicker based on what I saw at the weekend. It's not to say Marcus Smith is slow, but I think Simmons might be a bit quicker. Um, he has got the pedigree of his brother, and he's not. And he has played. Did he play fifty? He's played fifteen in subs or on the wing for the at subs sometimes. Um, so he's he's reasonably quick. Um, whereas Marcus Smith, I think, is just very attacking to the line I, I i really rate marcus smith i mean we've had a a 45 minute podcast on marcus smith talking about him and that got two thousand odd views on youtube and x number of views and you know people really are hyping up marcus smith and quite rightly so i think he's brilliant um so yeah those two will be duking it out for uh for the 10 shirt when ford and farrell eventually um throw it away speaking of yeah i'm glad to um, hear someone else actually uh back joe simmons is a future contender for Marcus Smith. A lot of people have been kind of waving that away, saying, no, Smith is the only one. But I, I agree with you. I think Simmons is going to be competing. Yeah. In fairness, 100%. I think uh, Smith has had a fair bit more exposure so far, so people are more likely to uh, uh, gravitate towards sure. that. But, um, uh, but as, as we said the podcast, it's overexposure, Ed. Yeah, that is true. Um, he needs a rest. Like He, he can go on a holiday with a Toji <laughs> and George North. Um, we need to set up a rugby spa, don't we? Where they can all just have a uh, six months off, uh, and they can just chill out and have a rest. Oh, they can get That's everyone gloriously overweight before they can get back to preseason. Um, exactly. I, Billy, I was gonna. Yeah. I wanted to make a slight tangent quickly. Now we got onto the subject of tens. Go on. We love an Ed tangent. Go um, it. It's relevant though, so I don't know how much. So it's it's <laughs> it is particular. I'm going to start off with Hooker though, um, because Hartley is apparently, apparently air quotes, injured. apparently injured. And so we've got Jamie George starting, yeah. Luke Cohen Dickey on the bench. And this means that uh, Owen Farrell at 12 is captain. Um, how do, so Eddie, what, Eddie what went do into we Harley's room and went, oi mate, you're not starting, you're it's, on the bench. Yeah, but I, I, mean, love this, I love that there's a conspiracy theory going on here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hartley yeah. is injured, it's fake news. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> it, absolutely. It's, I, just, I think it's it, because there's been a fair bit of speculation on what this could or does potentially mean for, you know, especially maybe it's. I think I've. I've. I'm sure I've put my fair share in of uh, defending Hartley. I, I. I won't defend him as Northampton player anymore. But my defence of him as an England captain <laughs> is okay. Fairly solid, but there has been mm-hmm. lots and lots of talk and lots of uh, aggrandizing about if George has an absolute blinder tomorrow. And does Farrell does a job as again? captain. What does this mean for Hartley? Especially considering that we are, what, uh, what is it, March at the moment? So Year out. September, 
year and a half. That's 18 months away from the World Cup. Um, mm. What would that mean? Would would Jones? Because as you said, as one of, as you just said that you know, there's a certain stubbornness about him. Would it be within Jones's uh, wheelhouse to upturn the spine of the team that much? By you know, I think, replacing I think our starting from my and point of view, my point of view is that I don't think, and it's interesting to me that Luke Cowan-Dickey is the third choice and obviously comes into the bench. Is this opposed I to believe Tommy that's Taylor right. or that's an, ex- that, that, that's an exciting prospect for me, Cowan-Dickey from the bench. Okay. Yeah, Cowan-Dickey from the bench is a good option, but I don't know if he's written himself into a corner here with Jones because. Jamie George off the bench is also a good option and Hartley as a reliable head on the pitch to start, that that was a nice combination and mentally that set the England team up to have two very experienced I mean one's a lion um, and then one's played for England for nearly 100 caps now um, I can't remember how, how many caps has Hartley got? Is 92 90 something? As of yeah. last, uh, so he's got a hell of a lot of caps he's got a lot of experience and Jamie George has a lot of experience um, so he's painting himself into a corner that these are his two yeah. Really, I think that that's very much his because scrum otherwise, half all over again. Yeah, kind of because because the the problem being is that although Luke Cowan-Dickey is exciting, he's good off the bench. The mentality of the team has to be: I can rely on every single person on this pitch. Okay, no matter what, when it comes down to the line, they need to be experienced enough. And if you're on the pitch and somebody of Luke Cowan-Dickey, he's got good caliber, but he's not got. I don't know, 25 caps under his belt, I don't think. I'm not 100% sure, but he doesn't have that repetitive playing time. Um, I think he, he doesn't has even less start... than five caps, Cowan-Dickey, yeah. at the moment. He, ex- there you go. Well, he doesn't ha- and he doesn't even start necessarily because of Yend or Exeter. He doesn't necessarily start week in, week out at Exeter. Now, they're the champions. They are obviously a high-quality team, but he's not necessarily starting week in, week out for them either. So there's just that there was that nagging feeling probably in Jones's head going, yeah, Cowan Dickey's great and he is great, but there's that small thing he's missing, and that's obviously the huge amount of game time that the other two have. I don't I don't know how you fix that situation, but other than just playing Luke Cowan Dickey, um, maybe Baxter needs to just go fuck it and put Cowan Dickey on every single match starting. But I think he's club captain's Yendel, so you can't really do that. I don't think I think you're saying you can to change that situation. I think once Hartley comes back fit, while he may not be as high a quality player as George mm-hmm. or maybe even Cameron Dickey, in, or certainly Cameron Dickey in certain areas, but or handling, I mean, yeah, yeah, or handling, ex- tackling, uh, carrying. He is physically he is a, an absolute monster compared to Hartley. Um, mm-hmm. But what Hartley has, it, it's 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 Hartley's it's his head, it's um it's his work rate, it's his leadership. A lot of the time you'll see. When um, if a team's awarded a free kick or something, Hartley is the first man in the line if they've been you know marched to a certain area. He's the first one. He does a yeah. little two-footed jump as well when he gets yeah. there. And I think I mean, he does it a lot. And I think it's kind of um, an exaggerated thing for for the team more than anyone else. Mm-hmm. I think it's like, look, I'm here. Follow it's me. That visual trigger. It is. Yeah, yeah. And they I probably think, do it in training. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. And I, that, that, that that's what you will miss with Hartley. The problem is if you finally say. Um, Right, yeah, no, Hartley isn't as good a rugby player as the other two. Bin him off, he's out. The problem, I think, then, I think you'd see a slow crumble mm-hmm. of the England side because of a leadership thing, and that's why, for me, he has to start. I think 100% he is the third best, maybe fourth best hooker in England as a player, but as yeah. a leader, he's the number one. And you need you need him. You can't really go without him until someone proves that they can they can step up, which is why Marco Vinopola has been named vice-captain um, yeah. this weekend. Okay. He has, yeah, yeah. He had, and he got an interview talking about the uh, qualities that he would need, and he was like, I don't really need to change anything, I'm just going to play. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's vice captain. <laughs> yeah. He's, but he's like vice that. captain. I like him. He's, 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 very, he's very dry, very dry into humour, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, is, that is, uh, it was actually quite funny to uh, see that. Interestingly, but, um, on the captain, yeah, sorry, on. interestingly, did you see um, a couple of quotes today from Owen Farrell about captaincy? I didn't I've seen lots of people talking about putting too much pressure on him, but I haven't seen what he said. Yeah, no. So there was an interesting one where he basically said, "I think if you look at the qualities most captains have, those mm-hmm. are the those are my qualities, or something like that." And it was a little bit self-aggrandizing. Eh? Well, I don't know whether it was out of context, but I read it and I thought that doesn't really sound like him. It was a bit odd. 
And it just, yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying that it means any one thing in particular, but it just stuck out to me. And I, I just, <laughs> he's, I can't get it out of my head. It's just a quote that's just there. Like that doesn't, that sounds a bit that's weird. Bold, isn't it? That yeah. is very bold. He's, um, he's, his interviews after a game don't come across like he would say that. No, he's usually no, well, a lot even more. Just his personality. A lot more modest, like a lot Northern. more grounded and down to earth. Mm-hmm. Although it's, mm. I, I, I will say, I do think. Maybe maybe it's just that my mind instantly goes back to him yelling at Chris Ashton, get on your wing. Um, but I kind of... <laughs> I, I like the idea of him being captain. I think I, I think the qualities are there. Um, he, he needs, I think, needs to cool his head a bit in certain situations. Um, mm-hmm. Yes. But I think there is, as I said, I, I'm intrigued at the very least, especially because going away and playing at France having your first start at... Well, I think it's his first start as captain. Um, uh, yes, it is. That's going to be... It is, because Rob Shaw was... Yeah, yeah, go on. That's going to be quite a quite a test, quite a what, trial by fire, I suppose. Um, 100%. I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I tell you, this... I mean, I'm doing the, the post-game show. This is an interesting place to advertise it. I'm doing the post-game show with Driving Mall for that one. Um, yeah, that's good. So I didn't know you were going on there. It's brilliant. Oh, are you in as well? No, sorry, no, 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 sorry, no, I'm on it. I'm just, you oh. know, it's good. I'll look, I'll, I'll look forward to listening to that. It's good. Cool. Um, but I didn't. So I, I'm just hyped. I'm, I'm going to obviously be coming off the back of a high of an England win or the absolute devastation of Tranduk running riot and Gerardo scoring a hat trick. <laughs> um, those, those are the only two options. There's nothing in between. And uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm really excited, and I hope. I really, really hope that obviously Watson has a good game at 15. That Daly is back to flying form on the wing, even though he's actually a centre. Um, <laughs> and all of these different, all of these different things that Eddie Jones has decided to change for this game to prove that he can change. I hope they all work out. To be honest with you. Um, and obviously, I hope Simmons comes on late game and does absolute wonders. So yeah, I'm going to be giving, I'm going to be giving a lot of chat um, pro Simmons. I think, regardless of what actually happens <laughs> in the game, if if Simmons didn't get on, I'm going to say Simmons should have got on. And if he does get on, every single thing that he did well, I'm just going to focus on that. That's that'll be uh, yeah. He throws a ball into touch. Oh no, the players around him weren't ready. They weren't on. Yeah. They weren't on it. They weren't on he it. heard a call. He heard a call. He heard a call. Yeah. He gave the ball. Come That's on. everyone else's fault. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Interesting. You actually mentioned earlier that you put him on the wing. I know. I know you joked, but mm. I don't know whether you've seen. That's kind of something I've been a little bit comically, but also honestly, champing a uh, champion is. I could very easily see him as a centre, as a I... thirteen. <laughs> He's. I. I mean, he is. Yeah. This he used is... to play on the wing. Depending on how far back you go, I spent a great deal of time championing, uh, wanting to see Tom Croft play on the wing. <laughs> because I thought that would have <laughs> worked. And I, I don't see how anyone can look at him and think, that's a bad idea. <laughs> well, it's the same for people like R.D. Severe as well, really. I mean, there's arguments for him to be a winger, um, but did he he's not, definitely not. Did he not come through sevens, though? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he so did. It's, I mean, so did, lot, so did I. Same with... Um, yeah, yeah, like you said so. There's a lot more, uh, a lot more wiggle room there, I think, for a player through from sevens. Um, Certainly, but I think Simmons is built like a perfect sevens player, almost. You know, he's rapid, he's strong, he can turn the ball over, he can pass. You know, that's a sevens player. Um, I, I actually do. I agree with Ali when he says that there, there should be nowadays a huge transfer of skills. I mean, you didn't specifically say this, but a transfer of skills from 7 and 13. You know, you've got to be quick, you've got to be strong, you've got to be a ball handler nowadays. This There's is no... the, the Justin Tipperick model. The Justin Tipperick model, exactly. Michael Hooper as well, if you look another one. To an extent, um, certainly. Hooper's rapid. Um, the uh, Hooper's hands, I'll question. Mm, but yeah. yeah, fair. But otherwise, certainly Hooper um, is a rapid rapid seven and less so of the kind of the lewis moody's of this world where uh you're a flying fox uh, sort of thing but you're more likely to get a boot in the head than kick the ball yourself <laughs> you know there's there's less of that nowadays and there's more of the the handling and throwing the ball about so yeah simmons i think simmons could be the revolution at seven and if him and mercer have to fight it out then Oh, I'd like I'd like a team with them both on the pitch. To be honest with you, 
I'd like Simmons at seven, Mercer at, at six, and then we can have an eight from. And then where does Rob Shaw go? Someone else. What about the Curries? Oh dear. The Curries, the the Vindaloo's. Twindaloo. The, what, what are they called you? It's Twindaloo's. So yeah. I, I don't. The Twindaloo's. Um, I have no idea where you put them. To be honest with you, I really rate them as it well. Is, but I don't. It, I don't know what is, you do with them. I think considering. Injuries have made for some very interesting selections over the last couple of years, and it's it is interesting to see the though the the next big thing is constantly being moved, passed over for someone else due to uh, mm-hmm. some form of injury. So very very quickly, because we've talked obviously at length, and we should probably wrap up at some point. Um, should we talk about just whether we're going to win against the French, or whether the French are going to pull something out of the bag? Um, with Tranduk, who, by the way, Fred said, is not starting for too long, is playing really badly, and just generally, he's surprised that he's even on the pitch. That means he'll be man of the match against us, right? That... <laughs> that, that's how this works with France. It means we're it means we're in trouble. That's what it means. It, it means we're in desperate trouble. I I, um, I don't want to. I don't. I don't think I really want to venture a guess at what the result might be because I think there's every possibility I'll just get my hopes up and then get hurt. Um. <laughs> because I think it's you've been it's, hurt before, Ed. It, I have been. It's it's difficult for it's difficult for any team to go and win in France. Um, and mm-hmm. so while we've had some luck over the last couple of years, um, I think 2012 might have been. No, that were. What is it? It's 2018 now, isn't it? It is. It's been a while. So I assume we won in 2016 because that's when we grand slammed, and 2014 was everything. when we got done over by some freakish rare bounce um but it's yeah it's it's okay. it's, it's going to be no what am i saying wait hang on no the rare bounce the rare bounce is when it's sat oh that is a horrible noise that somebody is, is making. um actually I'm, I, I feel like i'm confusing myself 2000 it's 2018 now isn't it I've just said that, and so it's, and have you, you're them. you're wandering in circles, Ed. Yeah, I am. I'm so we're playing them in Paris, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. I feel although like they I'm, played Italy, did I'm, they play Italy in Marseille? Yeah, I'm. I'm getting some. I'm yeah, getting my yeah. timelines mixed up. Going, uh, remembering past six nations. I'm becoming a, an unreliable source for past results. So. You used to be so good with these facts. That's why we have you on the pod. I'm fairly sure the... it's still there. I'm just getting slightly. Uh, you're the England fact machine. Because I'm sure I'm trying to remember. Because I thought 2012. I'm so I'm sure I remember Ed, France. Ed, I'll tell you here. what. I'll bring you back. I'll bring you back. Who scored in the 2003 uh, semi-final for England? No one. It was oh, just Johnny go. kicking them to death. <laughs> so there we go. Um, um, I'll work it out, and we job. can we can. Uh, work, You'll work yeah. it back from 2003, and hopefully we will. Um, <laughs> we'll be fine. I'm going to go for an England victory. Okay. Um, and I'm going to go... I'm going to go... Actually, just because just you've been saying 2012 over enough, I'm going to say we're going to win 2012. Um, I think the French are going to get four pens and we're going to get four at least two tries. tries. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get at least two tries. This is another thing. So I'm going to rewrite one of my articles and it's actually going to focus on the fact that Farrell's kick percentage is one of the worst in the Northern Hemisphere. How clickbaity can I make that? Hmm. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so Farrell's going to miss all his conversions, and we're going to get four unconverted tries. Then we get the bonus point, and we'll get the bonus point, and we'll all be happy. Ali, what do you think? What's going to happen? Yeah, no, I can see, uh, I can see three or four, three or four English tries, probably around. I go twenty twenty six points to to seventeen. Okay. So the French, the French are getting the French are getting a try or two back. Yeah, I expect they'll get at least at least two. I reckon. All right. So maybe I'll leave Bonneval in the team then. <laughs> and the fan, the fan, the fancy team needs to uh, needs to be ready. Um, Ed, have you have you worked out what you want to uh, estimate on score wise? I think the winning Ed, team will get a bonus know. point. You think the winning team will get a bonus point? But I couldn't okay. tell you which team will win. That might be a bit of you're, a cop out. You're unusually pessimistic. Yeah, I, you're I'm unusually always pessimistic. pessimistic. It's 
I mean, I might, uh, I might, I mean, I, I desperately hope for an English win with a bonus point, so there's still a chance that we can win the championship for a, uh, the, be the first mm. team to do it three in a row. But I, it's, I am, by my very nature, uh, an eternal pessimist. Um, All right, fair enough. So it's, I tell you what, it's, uh, let's see. Mm. So we, should we wrap up then? I know Ed, you're still mulling. I am mulling. It's gonna, something. it's gonna be on me for a while. Um. All right. Well, if if uh, if you ever remember it, send me a recording and I'll put it into the middle of the in- the outro music <laughs> and it'll just like pop up randomly. Um, so this has been Library Rugby Podcast. Um, go and view, read, and eventually listen to um, Ali's Crash Ball Rugby website. Um, he honestly he does a lot more work than we do. We we turn up every other month and randomly do a podcast and then talk about an article that we wrote in two thousand and sixteen. <laughs> um, but yeah, listen listen and read uh, Crash Ball Rugby, and uh, that's been me, Sav. Uh, if everyone else wants to say goodbye, yeah, goodbye. thanks very much for having me, guys. I've uh, really appreciated it. It's all right. Hopefully we can. Ed, do you want to say goodbye? Uh, so yeah, 2012 was the one I was thinking about. I just thought it was at Twickenham, not at uh, not in uh, oh, okay. Paris. But yeah, so I worked it out. So all all has come good. So just just to confirm, that was how Ed said goodbye. <laughs> um, if I hadn't have said it, it would have worn on. It would it would have just you know it would have bugged me for a while. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> you know I'm like this. You you that's moderate better. Yeah, moderate better. <laughs> You're meant to be the moderator, anyway. Um, but yeah. Moderate, moderator of Reddit, anyway. Well, the the outro music is definitely playing at this point in time. If you want to Great sing music, along, to uh, Ed. Do 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 do. There we go. Good stuff. So I'll now I'll now sync that up so that your do's link up with the do's. Right. Do we want to stop our recording? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. I went all right. Yes. Happy days. Thank you.